Welcome to Walking Through the Word. I am Josiah Espinoza. Today we will be reading John chapter 6, verse 22 through verse 34. So if you have your Bibles with you, open them with me as we walk through the Word together. Um, now, I'm, I am a Reformed theologian, and I believe in the five points of Cal Calvinism. And um, John chapter 6 is one of the main texts that we as Reformed theologians will go to um, in order to show that God um, has a has an elect people, a people that He has chosen for Himself before the foundations of the world, um, by no merit of the people whatsoever. There was nothing that anybody could have done or said um, that could have changed the mind or the plans of God in electing for Himself a specific people, um, and that these people are the ones whom the Father gives to the Son. And so we're going to see Jesus now interacting with the same people that He just fed in earlier scriptures in verses 1 uh, through 15, we're going to see the same group of people who were just fed by Jesus interacting with Jesus. And Jesus starts to say some pretty intense, some pretty marvelous, beautiful, and truthful things. And a lot of people have a hard time um, accepting what Jesus has to say. But if you are indeed a believer and you hold to the truths of the Scripture, and you understand what it means to exegete the Scriptures properly, and you understand what it means to allow for the text to stand for itself and to say what it's trying to say without approaching the text with any philosophical or tra traditions or any other prior understanding of the text, if you just come to the text and try to understand them in the context that they are being uh, stated, then you will be able to grasp the full understanding of these texts. Um, so we start in verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So these are the same people that Jesus fed with the, uh, with the two fish and the five loaves of bread. He fed upwards of 5,000 men, not including men and children, or excuse me, women and children. And um, some would estimate that there was maybe over 10,000, maybe closer to 15,000 people present at the time when Jesus fed the crowds. And so the people realized, hey, Jesus didn't go with his disciples, and that they had crossed the sea. They went to Capernaum, and so they went to Capernaum as well. In verse 25 it says, When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? As if... They didn't know when he got there or as if they were like, hey, what are you doing here, Jesus? Like, we, when did you get here? Almost ask, asking like a surprised question. And verse 26, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, this is this is an incredible thing for Jesus to say. Again, truly, truly, this is a... A, um, a Hebrew way, a Jewish way of, of emphasizing something to be true. They repeat it twice. They want to emphasize it. And when he says truly, truly, he's saying like this, this is the reality of things. This is what's really going on here. You're seeking me not because I did this miracle. So they weren't even seeking him for the miracle that he performed. They weren't seeking Jesus for the power that he displayed before their very eyes. He's saying, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So it's like Jesus is rebuking them for saying, I performed this miraculous miracle, and instead of looking for me for the work that I did, you're looking for me so that you can eat. Now most of the time, Jesus condemns people for the miracles, for looking for miracles. And now he's condemning this crowd's for not even recognizing the miracles, but for eating food. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for free meals. And it says in verse 27, 
Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. So let's go through that again. Do not work for the food that perishes. Jesus is rebuking them because they are looking for something that will eventually pass through their system and exit out of their system. And they will bring nothing. Eventually they'll get hungry again and they'll want to eat again. So Jesus says, don't look for that food. Don't work for that food. That food is not, uh, is not important. Even though it may satisfy you for a little bit, you should not be working toward that kind of food. He says, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And he hasn't told them yet what that is. He just tells them what they ought to be doing. They shouldn't be seeking Jesus for food that they can put in their stomach. But they should be seeking Jesus for food that endures to eternal life. And he says, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And again, we've talked about this before. Son of Man is a reference to the coming Messiah who will establish the kingdom of God. It is a divine title given to the one who will come to establish the kingdom of God on earth. That title is given uh, to the one who is going to appear to establish the kingdom of God, who will reign forever, who will sit in the seat of God as king forever. And that title is given to the one who appears in the, in the clouds. That's in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. And Jesus says that he is the one who is going to give them this. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So Jesus is making this proclamation to these, these crowds. And he's made this same proclamation before in chapters 5, verse 19 through 46 if you or 47 if you have time to read that he makes that same um, assertion that the son of man is the one um, whom the people are going to be judged by and he basically says that he is the son of man now he's talking to a new crowd he's talking to a new set of people and he's making the same assertion um and he hasn't really said that he is the Son of Man yet, but he's telling them that instead of working for food that will perish, look for food that will endure to, to eternal life. This food is going to be given to them by the Son of Man because God has set his seal upon him. And what does that mean to set a seal? Well, if you know anything about uh, kingly authority, and whenever somebody, whenever the king wanted to give authority over to another individual, he would give him a seal, something that would uh, tell the people that he is acting in place of the king. He would give him a seal, something that would uh, prove his right to either do something in the name of the king or uh, to execute judgment or to proclaim a specific law or something. He would do something in the name of that king, and that seal would be the authority, would be the evidence that he is indeed somebody who comes in the name of the king. And so what Jesus is saying is that this son of man who's going to give bread that endures to eternal life or food that endures to eternal life, that is the one whom God has set his seal on. Listen to what he says in verse 28. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Now that's a good question. That is the right question to ask. And, and, and I want you to pay attention here because the people are going to ask a lot of good questions within the next few segments of walking through the Word. They're going to be asking God or Jesus really, really awesome questions, questions that every person ought to ask. And yet, at the very end, we're going to see that no one believes. And that's the most incredible thing, is that people can ask the right questions. People can uh, try to understand what it means to do the works of God, and they can even receive the right answer from Jesus. And so you might ask yourself, well then why, 
why do they ask? Why don't they believe then if Jesus is the one telling them? And we're going to get that in future segments because Jesus tells them why. Jesus explains to them why they don't believe. Jesus explains to them why they can't do the works of God. So listen to what he, the question again. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And so what would you tell somebody who asks you the same question? Who, what would you tell to that individual? In order to do the works of God, this is what you must do. This is the question that they asked Jesus. And Jesus gives them the answer, the answer that we should all give to individuals. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. So, I can just imagine Jesus pointing to Himself when He's saying these words. Because look at what it says in verse 30. So they said to Him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? So, now they're still waiting for food. They're still waiting for something to be done in order to satisfy them temporarily. Now imagine that same individual who comes up to you and asks you, So, um, what do I need to do to, in order to be saved? It's basically the question. What do I need to do in order to be doing the works of God? Obviously, I'm not in the grace of God. I'm not regenerate. I'm not born again believer. What must I do to be doing the works of God? And you tell him, you must believe in the one whom God has sent. And that is Jesus. You need to believe in him. And they said, what if they were to say to you, well, can you do a miracle to prove to me that Jesus is really the one I need to believe in? You see the dilemma here? Miracles don't save anybody. Works and performances of God to the people, that, that doesn't save anybody. When God does these things, it's so that His power can move on people that He has grace and mercy on. But it never saves anybody. If, if God were to just do miracles at churches, nobody would ever get saved. They would just marvel and they say, ooh and ah, but nobody would ever get saved because the, the Word is not being preached, the Gospel is not being preached. And look at what he, they go on to say in verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're still looking for food. They still want to be fed. They still want to have something in their bellies. They're like, okay, so what performance do you, are you going to do for us? What kind of miracle? You know, God said in the Old Testament that He gave them manna from heaven, so uh, that would be cool if you do that for us, basically, is what they're saying. And listen to the answer Jesus gives them. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34 says, They said to Him, Sir, give us this bread always. Now that's a, that's a good answer. That is an appropriate answer. We're not going to finish here. We're going to continue on to verse 40. But that's a good answer. They said to, Jesus tells them, you know, it wasn't Moses who gave you the manna. It was my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And this is it. This is the bread. And I'm going to tell you, this is the bread. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And Jesus is saying this about himself. And the people know this because they're asking him, well, what, what sign are you, are you going to do then? What, what are you going to perform for us? What are you going to do in order that we may believe? And they, when Jesus tells them that, that the true bread from God is, is he who comes down, is me, I'm come down from heaven and I give life to the world. And they said to him, well, yeah, give us this bread. We want this bread. And yet, Jesus doesn't say, okay, yeah, here's the bread then. Here's eternal life. Here's salvation. He actually continues to explain what he means. Because the people are not understanding. Listen to what verse 35 says. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, but whoever believes in me, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So the literal translation of this, I am the bread of life. Everyone coming to me shall not hunger, and everyone believing in me shall never thirst. So it's not only just a one-time thing. It is a continual thing that you do. You are coming to Him. You are believing in Him. These are the ones that shall not hunger. These are the ones who will never thirst. These are the ones who are partaking in the bread of life. Jesus is that bread. And the one who is coming and the one who is believing is the one who is partaking in the bread of life. And listen to what He says to in verse 36. So, so just, just really quick. The people ask Jesus, What do you do in order that we may believe? And Jesus says, That you believe in me. That you would believe in me. That you would believe in the one that came down from heaven. This, this bread that the Father gives. That's, that's what you need to do. You need to receive this bread. And to say, Okay, give us this bread. And then Jesus proclaims it to them. I am the bread. That's me. And whoever comes to me, me who is the son of man, me who is going to give you this bread, you shall never go hungry. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So he proclaims it to the crowd. It's a general proclamation of the gospel to them. And listen to what he says in verse 36. But I say it to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And that would blow anybody away. Who, whoever is reading this with me should be asking themselves, why is this happening? Why aren't they believing? Jesus is telling them, you would think, that if anybody would come to Christ, it would be the ones who are listening the very, to the very words of Jesus about who He is as the bread of life. And yet He tells them, you see me, and yet you do not believe. And then He explains to them why they don't believe in verse 37. Listen to what this says. And I want us to pay, pay very close attention to this. Because this is so important. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Alright, let's stop right there. Jesus proclaims the gospel in verse 35. He tells them that they've seen him and yet they don't believe. And in verse 37, he tells them why they don't believe. They don't believe because... All that the Father gives me or gives to Him will come to Him. So in order for those individuals to believe, the Father has to give them to the Son. And you say, well then, how do I make the Father give me to the Son? And the answer is, you can't make the Father give you to the Son it is by the Father's free choice and free sovereign grace and mercy upon the creature that He ends up giving Him over to the Son so that He would go to the Son. This is what, look at what it says at the rest. And whoever comes, so the one who is coming, right? The one that the Father gives will come and whoever is coming to me, I will never cast out. And Jesus is explaining to them exactly why in the same, in the, almost the same breath, Jesus tells them the gospel, and yet some do not believe. The reason you don't believe is because the Father has not given you to me. Because all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever is coming to me, I will never cast out. This is an immense immense truth and if you're not seeing this with me then I, I, I pray and that you would go back and listen to this portion again because it's very very important this is known as God's unconditional election and irresistible grace he chooses some for his own glory and purposes and he draws those individuals whom he has chosen before the foundations of the world perfectly he draws them so that the son might save them perfectly Look at what it says in verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, 
that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is known as the perseverance of the saints, or as some people say, the preservation of the saints. That those people whom God has unconditionally elected are the same people that Jesus died for, are the same people that He irresistibly draws to the Son so that they may be saved perfectly by the Son. And then God is the one who will raise Him up on the last day and He will lose none of whom He has given over to the Son. This is the marvelous work of God. This is the incredible sovereign grace of God. Listen to what it says in verse 40. For this is the will of my Father. Now listen, pay attention to that. Because it's not about man's will. And it's not about our free choices, about our autonomous libertarian choice. It's about God's will. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. Now, a lot of the times, some people will use this and say, see, that means anybody can come because Jesus died for the whole world and therefore everybody has the same chance. But in the context, the word everyone is meant to be for the ones whom the Father gives to the Son. And it's the same individuals whom the Father will give perfectly to the Son and whom the Son will never cast out and whom the Father will lose none of. This is an incredible truth. That is the will of the Father, that everyone, not everybody in the whole world who's ever lived, who's ever going to live, but everyone whom the Father gives to the Son, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. This is an incredible profound truth and if you, again if you are not seeing this with me i pray that you would go back and listen to this or go back you read it by yourself meditate on what the lord is saying in these passages god is sovereign he's sovereign over his creatures he is able to do as he pleases with his creatures he can save whom he pleases because the reality of it is is that we are all depraved we are all not believing at some one point or another, all of us did not believe in Jesus and none of us wanted the bread that came down from heaven. None of us wanted the Son. None of us wanted to believe in the Son of Man. None of us wanted to uh, receive the one whom the Father has sent down. But the Father, by His grace and His mercy, even when we were hating the Son, even when we wanted nothing to do with the Son, the Father gave us to the Son he broke our hearts and He humbled us so that we would come to the Son. So the Father gave us to the Son and we come to the Son and the Son embraces us and He saves us from our own wickedness and depravity. And not only does He save us, but He sets us apart and He promises that He will, new, he will lose none of us and He will raise us on the last day. This is the will of the Father. And if you are not rejoicing at the sovereign grace and the sovereign hand of God, then I beg you, please, please go back and read these scriptures. Understand them in context. Look at the consistent um, point of view about God's free will and saving. Since the very beginning of the book of John, we see that God's sovereign hand and free will in choosing some for Himself has been thoroughly um, just reiterated from chapter 1 till now and it's going to continue this same concept of God's free choice in choosing some for himself you need to understand this that we do not uh, uh, cooperate with God in saving ourselves we I do not believe that the synergist has the the compatible view of knowing exactly how the salvific work of Christ is um comes about in the life of the believer because God does not wait for permission. God does not wait for us to say, okay, now, now that you have made the choice for me, now I'm going to choose you. No, God, by His sovereign grace and sovereign hand, He chooses some because 
if given an infinite amount of time that he would say, okay, I'm going to let man make the, his own decisions. If given an infinite amount of time, men will always choose not to be with God. They will spit in the face of the gospel and in the face of Christ and in the face of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. They will spit and they will mock. And that has always been the nature and the character of men until now. They still do it today. And when I, when I read passages like this, I have full assurance that God will save and that He will save perfectly because He gives all that He pleases to the Son and the Son will lose none of them. And I pray that this message has been uh, illuminating to you. I pray that this message has been truth to your ears and I pray that the Spirit would bring you to spiritual life, that you would be humbled before the Son, that you would be humbled before God. And that you would learn to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. May the Lord richly bless you and keep you in his loving arms.